Okay, so uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is the research that I uh, uh, have started uh, myself, but I've also been uh, in, in, in terms of uh, uh, looking at sighthound and, and adverse drug reactions in sighthounds, but um, a couple of your members uh, uh, have wrote me into looking at specifically uh, 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 Scott, Scottish deer hunting. So, okay, so um, my background is actually I'm a trained anesthesiologist. Uh, I trained at Tufts University, and so um, not that long after I graduated, I got a phone call from one of our recent graduates from Tufts, um, Tom. I want to hear his last name because of uh, uh, association with guilt. But uh, <laughs> um, next, um, so he uh, was at a practice in Central Massachusetts, and he would have been only there for about a year. And uh, he had uh, anesthetized a greyhound for a dental procedure, a five-year-old male greyhound for a dental procedure. And at that time, this is in the middle of the 80s, uh, pliopental was what they used for the pentatolin. It's very common anesthetic back then. It's not used in the United States now. You can't get it anymore in the United States, but it's actually used outside in Europe and also in Australia. Um, and um, he used it for a dental cleaning. He gave me a couple of pop-ups and next um, he came across this adverse reaction, which we're all kind of familiar with now in anesthesiology, but the, this particular dog took uh, forever to recover. For 24, 48 hours, it was just flying around the cage, um, having a, a terrible time. Eventually, it did recover, and he was just totally flabbergasted as to what was going on. So he went back, and as good graduates do, they go back and look at their notes from when they were in vet school. And he actually did get a lecture on sight down and I said, should that have a And he realized that he probably screwed up and that in this case that he probably should have used that newfangled drug called propofol, which had just come out at that time. And so he asked these questions um, of me and I really couldn't answer them at the time. So the question he asked were, his boss had given Viapentol to actually plenty of greyhounds before this and never really had a problem. So why did, doesn't this happen with all greyhounds? So that's the first thing that, that we were dealing with. The other question that he came up with is, you know, it's, it's not all greyhounds, it's some greyhounds. But the other thing is that uh, should we be careful with any other breeds? So does, does this problem that they've seen, which uh, can potentially be solved by switching drugs, does that problem also happen in other dog breeds? So we're telling Italian greyhounds, we've got the same last name, so it must, right? Um, Whippets, Afghans, also, and now we can add to that list Scottish deer. So that was a, a problem back then that really fascinated me, and it's taken me probably 30 years to actually to be able to do some basic research back to address this. So, thanks. This is uh, what I came to join at Washington State University about 10 years ago. Uh, this is the program in Individualized Medicine Prime at Washington State University. And our, our primary goal is to understand the genetics of adverse drug reactions in, in dogs. First um, uh, person actually that started this and recruited me there was uh, Dr. Katrina Mealy. And her interest was actually in adverse drug reactions to ivermectins and cancer drugs in particular in herding weed dogs. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Is everyone familiar with that? Yeah, everyone's familiar? Anyone not familiar? Okay, so um, she developed the MDR1 test. So um, uh, Dr. Mealy um, actually discovered and developed the test into uh, something that we all use uh, today, uh, particularly if you've got a, a herding breed dog that um, needs a cancer drug treatment because it's a very uh, uh, and, and dogs that have that mutation, they have really nasty reactions. And so you can, if the dog has the mutation, you can adjust the dose, you can use different drugs. And so that was the, the basis for why she was interested and she convinced the dean to try and bring a core of people together to actually work on these problems, these uh, breed-related uh, drug problems. And so that first um, down there is the, the um, anesthesia sensitivity, which really appealed to me because I was an anesthesiologist, so I like to be able to sort this out. And so that was really the first thing that I started working on about 10 years ago when I first came to Washington State. One thing that we didn't uh, know at that time was what is the gene? So 
that's really the first step is trying to identify the gene and then what's the mutation in the gene that could potentially be explaining that. So I've been working on that with um, uh, Stephanie Martinez, uh, who actually just left. She got a position now at Kansas State University. Um, the other uh, problems that I started to work on, not as well developed, but this issue of hyperthermia, and so that's increased blood, uh, sorry, increased um, uh, uh, body temperature. Um, it, we'll get into it into a little bit exactly what it is, but it's something that occurs. It's rare, but it does certainly happen under certain circumstances and associated potentially with certain drugs. And so um, Miranda uh, Levin and John Dilberger uh, really got me interested in looking at this in, in Scottish deer hounds. And then the last um, problem, which is the problem that's actually more most developed at the moment in terms of coming up with a, a gene and a test, is actually post delayed postoperative bleeding in, in deer hound. Um, and again, you can see Greyhound, Deerhound, Greyhound, Deerhound. They're the, the, the breeds that I've been working with, um, and it's uh, you know very nice complementary to be able to work on, on both breeds because I think there's a lot of uh, similarity in terms of the type, type of problems that these guys have. So what we did know about thiopental dates back to the 1980s, around the same time, and what they did was they did these studies and they looked at the blood levels of these drugs and they showed the blood levels of the drug when you give it to a, a greyhound compared to a, a mixed breed, a non-specific dog, you can see that the, the blood levels are actually much higher in greyhounds than they are in other breeds with thiopental. And that's the reason why they take so much longer to wake up because the blood level has to drop with time you know, moving to the right there, the blood level is dropping with time, and it has to reach that dotted red level uh, for the animal to actually wake up. So it takes their, you know, six hours, eight hours before the, the dog will wake up from the same dose given to a, dog, a mixed breed dog. The interesting thing was for another drug that's related to it, uh, called pentobarbital or nembutol, um, you can use that, and, and there's actually no difference between greyhounds and, and other, other breeds of dog, which is really interesting because they're the same general kind of uh, drug, but you know, what's, what's the difference? The third drug that was developed, um, and in part, um, it was one of the first drugs actually tested in greyhounds to make sure that they would wake up appropriately. Actually, there was, still was a difference. You can see there that um, the greyhounds have higher blood levels of the drug. They do take a little bit longer to wake up, but actually the drug wears off so quickly that you don't really see that much of a difference. Um, the dog will wake up after a standard dose of propofol in about five uh, to 10 minutes, whereas it'll take maybe 15 to 20 minutes, which is not, not that much, much of a problem. And so propofol seems to be fine. So that's where I kind of stepped in um, the, this data is actually from uh, maybe the mid-1900s, and then uh, I had an uh, 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 honors thesis student who came in and finished up a lot of the studies. But what we have there is, is not the, the dogs themselves, but we've been able to, over the years, uh, to collect uh, very fresh liver specimens from dogs that have died for various reasons, and uh, use those as a model system to really a model what's happening in the dog itself. And what we have on the right-hand side here is different, uh, um, different breeds of, of dogs, uh, livers, that we've managed to be able to extract. Um, 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 member, it, it, it's the actual enzyme part of it that metabolizes the drug. And what you can see there is for propofol, it's the metabolism, how fast it's broken down. The metabolism is actually what is what's causing the drug level to drop. It's being metabolized in the liver. Get, you get rid of it. And what you can see there is the racing greyhound on the right-hand side has much lower uh, ability to metabolize propofol and get rid of it from its body as opposed to research beagles, research hounds, and I even have a Labrador retriever up there. So you can see there that this this large difference between breeds, which is very interesting. So what am I talking about in terms of metabolism? We need to get down to a gene, right? We need to find a gene that we can identify a, a mutation in. Um, well, we do know that this drug propofol is actually um, metabolized, it's broken down by this um, very important enzyme in our liver. We all have it. So that's essentially what happens. 
Propofol is metabolized by the A cytochrome P450 enzyme, metabolizes it, breaks it down, and it forms a metabolite that has no anesthetic effect, and that's it's flushed out into our urine. So that's that's one thing that we knew about this. But what we do know is that there's many different um, cytochrome P450s uh, enzymes. There's in dogs. There's um, uh, nine to ten that are important in terms of metabolizing drugs. And so one of the things that we have to first work out is what specific cytochrome P450 metabolized propofol and therefore that will give us a target to go and look for gene mutations. And so after um, doing these kinds of studies what we determined was that it was this cytochrome P450 called 2B11, 2B11, you can see it there. And that's, that's the one that metabolizes propofol most um, rapidly in, in dogs. And it also happens to do it in humans as well. So um, that points to the um, enzyme called CYP2B11. So what did we have um, to look at to confirm that actually the reason might be is that it's just less amounts of 2B11 in the, the uh, dog's liver. And we had, again, these liver specimens again, and we could actually measure how much of that 2B11 was actually in, so 2B11 was actually in the liver specimens. And this shows that compared to beagles, mixed breeds, greyhounds have actually much lower levels. So for some reason, they have very low levels of that enzyme in their liver. So that gave us a target to go after, and so we started sequencing the gene for the CYP2B11 enzyme. And what we found was very interesting. We didn't find it um, a classical mutation that would alter the, the, the protein, the, the protein that's being made. It actually turned out it was in a regulatory part of the, the gene. So it was an indirect cause. And so that actually it made it difficult to actually uh, um, find initially, so we had to look out of the normal region, but also made it difficult to actually prove that a mutation in that breed causes this problem. So that's, that's what we've been trying to associate with. We can find a mutation, how do we prove that that mutation actually changes um, the, the, the function of that protein and therefore causes this drug sensitivity. And so we found, um, in, in many breeds, we found a, a very common uh, number of mutations, but actually the rarer mutation, which was uh, really mostly found in, in greyhounds, is that one there, the 1952 mutation, um, also called that the H3 mutation. And what we did was we took that uh, uh, piece of actually DNA and actually put it into a cell and then worked out how much of that um, hung around for uh, a period of time. And th that actually tells us the, about the instability of that particular region of DNA. And what we found is that that H3 uh, mutation caused the, 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 the gene to be much less stable than what it should be. So it destabilized it, and that H3 over there causes about a 70% drop in the amount of the, uh, the gene that's uh, present. So. Uh, we published this relatively recently. Um, something that also uh, we were able to do at the same time, if you look on the right-hand side, there's this uh, yellow uh, blob called POR, or it's also called P450 oxidoreductase. And we wanted to look at that too because that actually is very critical to the function of the cytochrome P450. It's actually important in terms of it's also important, it transfers electrons, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a complicated function, but it's essential. And so if you have misfunction of that, um, and people do have misfunction of that, it can really screw up your metabolism. You can have uh, steroid hormone imbalances and, and so on. So that was uh, important for us to actually look at, at least in greyhounds, and see what was going on. So, so we, we went and we did some sequencing of this POR gene, this P450 oxidoreductase. And what we found actually interesting were two mutations. Um, they both caused changes in the amino acid and in the protein. Um, and uh, on the, on the left-hand side is one of the mutations at position 315. Um, and we had uh, beagle dogs and we had greyhounds, and we saw in most of the greyhounds this, this uh, mutation. And then on the right-hand side, this 570 mutation. Um, and what we see is that, again, it's not in uh, uh, beagles and other dogs, but it's in greyhounds. 
So again, we've got the issue of we found a mutation, we know it changes the protein structure, but what does it do in terms of the function of the protein? Can we show that it actually alters the function? We did some initial, um, uh, 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 if you go back, yeah, we did some initial modeling of this um, uh, using a, a, a computer program that a collaborator of ours at the University of Bern, and he looked at the two mutations, because the one thing we wanted to know is, is it that mutation or is it the other mutation? So we looked at the 315 mutation and the 570 mutation, and based upon his computer models, he predicted that uh, the 315 is the one that's likely to be damaging to the function of this protein. And so we wanted some experimental evidence, some functional evidence, and we did some uh, cell expression uh, experiments. And again, what we were able to show is that if we put this into a cell, this variant protein, it greatly decreases the function of the cytochrome P450. So it's an indirect effect that it has on the P450 uh, metabolism. So we saw an effect from the 315, but not from the 570. So we know that that 315 mutation is something that we should pay attention to. So one of the things that we wanted to, to look at is because if we're thinking that these genetic mutations should be somewhat specific to sighthounds and in particular greyhounds, um, uh, we hypothesized that we should really only find it mostly in sighthounds and not really in many other breeds. So what we have at the Washington State University Hospital is actually a DNA bank that we collect. So every patient that comes through, uh, we try to collect a DNA specimen from them and we put it into a bank so we can tie it then back to any disease or whatever uh, problem that they're having. So one thing that it does allow us to do is we can um, use that to look at different breeds, so the breed frequencies of these different mutations. So for this, what we had was um, uh, DNA samples, and there's, uh, in each of these, uh, is, I believe it's at least 30 different dogs represented of each breed, and we have 19 sighthound breeds there, and we have 48 other breeds that we've actually, and you can't see it goes off the screen because they've got zero, it's not there in those breeds. So what we can see there is the mutation frequency, and I'm summing both the 2B11 and the POR because they're the two mutations, these two mutations that we think affect metabolism in greyhounds. And what you can see there on the left-hand side is that the summed mutation frequency is highest in both AKC um, greyhounds. We were able to get to 61 samples from AKC and um, racing greyhounds, I've got 170 um, the dogs in there. There are differences in terms of the frequencies of the 2B11 versus POR, but when you sum them up, it's actually, the greyhound is the, it's not, it's the most frequent um, uh, breed that has these, these mutations. Not all of the breeds have it, so that was kind of going back to that question I was asked about, you know, is it all sighthounds? If you look at Afghans, Azawaks, Besenjis, Irish Wolfhounds, Irish Wolfhounds for a lot of things that they're, they're uh, very uh, safe uh, in terms of uh, safe, but they, they, they don't have the mutations that we're looking for. So they, they seem to be different for sure. Um, there's some interesting uh, things over here. Uh, one is um, the, the, there's a, a Welsh Corgi there that is in there, and that's something that came up. So it, it, it tells us about other breeds that potentially we, we could look at for, for potential problems. Um, and the breed that's of interest to me is actually golden retrievers because I've had a lot of golden retrievers. And it turns out that my uh, golden retriever actually is a carrier of one of the, the 2B11 mutations. So some of the studies that we've done, you know, at being in veterinary research, your pets are often your subjects. <laughs> I've, I've done it with my cats and with all my dogs. So they're usually the first to volunteer and they love it. <laughs> it's just taking blood. Um, so again, uh, greyhounds are up there. Interestingly, Scottish deerhounds are up there. Um, POR, the POR mutations are the more frequent in the Scottish deerhounds. The next step is actually, so we've done all these you know, in vitro, computer-based. We really need to now test it in the dog itself. And uh, we could potentially have uh, gone down the route of giving, say, propofol to every um, uh, greyhound and comparing it uh, to say another breed like golden retriever, um, that's we get a little bit of information based upon that. There's also issues related to safety because 
when you go to the um, IACUC, the Animal Welfare Committee, they don't, don't usually, if you're saying this could cause problems, they don't really like you to give a drug that's going to cause a problem. So we have to have another way to test to see that uh, this enzyme is not functioning properly in these particular breeds. And one way is we, if we use a surrogate drug, a drug that's metabolized by the same enzyme but is actually a lot safer to, to give. So we have one drug that we know and we've proved is um, metabolized by CYP2B11. That's a drug called bupropion or Zyban. It's not used that much in, in dogs. It's actually used a lot for treating depression and for smoking cessation. And that's generally something that dogs don't tend to have, they don't tend to smoke. So, um, but it, we have good doses for it. It's very safe and it really has very uh, little side effects. We also wanted to have some positive controls to make sure that what we're uh, looking at is really showing us that, that it, it's, it's really just the difference with, the, with that particular enzyme, with that 2B11. So we've developed, and this is an approach used in, in people for exploring drug metabolizing enzymes, we've developed what we, what we call a P450 test drug cocktail. And this is actually three drugs um, that we're giving together. We've given them separately and shown that they don't interact with each other. There's no health concerns, that they're not, there's not, no problem with it. And so we've um, um, developed this cocktail for, uh, that includes bupropion or Zyban, omeprazole or Prilosec, and the third drug is dextromethorphan or uh, robitussin. And um, that independently measures three different enzymes. And so what we, we do is we give that cocktail to the dogs, and the idea is that we we would test. We have tested um, greyhounds and golden retrievers. We can measure the amount of the drug and how much of the metabolite that's being formed in the uh, blood and urine. And the idea is that we would at the end get a ratio that uh, of the metabolite to the drug that tells us how fast is the metabolism in that particular uh, dog compared to that dog. And so uh, the expectation was that in greyhounds we would have low uh, metabolic ratios that would be normal uh, for the omeprazole, and then they would be also normal or no difference for the dextromethorphan. So, well, so that, that would tell us whether we've got a breed difference, which is, is what we were thinking um, based upon, you know, data from before, but we also wanted to look within the breed to know whether these mutations that were found, because not all the dogs have that mutation, we wanted to see if dogs that have the mutation metabolize drugs differently from drugs that don't have the mutation. And so this is a, like a, a part of that study, it's a sub-project in that study, where we give it and we're going to compare the dogs that are mutant that have that uh, mutation to dogs that are normal, and again we're expecting those that are mutant to have low uh, activity. Okay, we have preliminary findings. I wish I had all of the findings that I could present, but um, um, we do have some findings, uh, not, not the findings that probably you're hoping that we'd have. So the first findings we have actually relate to the 2D15 uh, uh, metabolism. That's a very important enzyme in people, highly variable between people, and people have adverse drug reactions from this. So it's, it's still important. Um, and what we uh, did was we have data for greyhounds compared to golden retrievers. We can see golden retrievers on average maybe a little bit less um, in terms of metabolism. But actually what is very interesting is that the golden retrievers have much more variability uh, between dogs than what um, greyhounds have. The greyhounds, these are just retired races. These are adopted pets that we recruited from the Spokane area. Um, golden retrievers, one of those dots is from my dog. Um, a bunch of them are from, from the uh, Spokane area. But you can see that there's big variation. And what really interested us mostly for um, a, a project that is actually now ongoing is actually to look at those dogs that have very low uh, levels of metabolism with this, um, with this enzyme. Because that, that could be an indicator of a, a presence of a mutation in that gene and therefore those drugs, those dogs might be sensitive to drugs that, that are metabolized by this enzyme. So that um, study is actually being done by Mara, who's there, raise a hand, and Dr. Perez is actually leading the study back there. So they are actually, that's, that's, she has a project funded by Mara's Animal Foundation to actually 
delve in and, and look at those um, to see whether there's mutations in there. That, and she's at, the main thing is that she, we've got 20 dogs. We want to uh, study another 40 dogs and find more of more of these. To, and, and we're going to retest some of these as well to make sure that we've got um, the same effect. So retired racing greyhound has such a good research background because there are, you know what dog came from where, from where, from where, from where. Because all of those records have been kept since Gracie started. And I'm wondering if, if you have done any of that comparison of. Sorry, lost my head. Yes, bloodlines. Yeah. Well, the, the, uh, what we really need to know from those dogs is what their, what they call phenotype is. We want need to know how well they can handle drugs. And you can get anecdotal information like we had from the, that, that young vet that found that dog reacted badly to that drug. Um, the problem is that we don't have that information for all of those dogs. Uh, we have some DNA from those dogs, but trying to work out uh, genetically um, what is the, you know, eventually, hopefully, we would be able to tra trace it back. Um, but mainly what we're after is something like, like this that's a test that we can say that, do that dog is a slow metabolizer. It also has these genes and therefore if it has that, those characteristics then these drugs should be um, uh, either avoided or used at much lower dosages. That's, that's kind of the direction we're going. Um, so this, this is serving a, a number, number of different, different purposes. Does that answer your question? Good. Okay, so that's really kind of how far we are with that. Um, we're hoping over the summer to get the other um, uh, drug metabolite levels um, measured and, and confirmed. Um, so this hypothermia syndrome that some of you may be aware of, uh, are you, raise your hand if you, you uh, have knowledge of this, so, oh, okay. So, um, this is, um, it's interesting, it, it, it seems to be a continuum of a, basically a spectrum of these, this uh, disorder which, and, and the worst case scenario is actually this, this condition called ma malignant hypothermia, which people have, pigs, horses, dogs, and it's um, really uh, a drug sensitivity where if you would give certain types of drugs, particularly uh, anesthetic dr inhaler anesthetic drugs, you'll get this reaction where basically the muscles uh, tense up and you get this great uh, increase in, in body temperature to the point where the, the animal just basically starts to melt down. Uh, I've witnessed it twice. Uh, I don't know if you have, um, but it's a, it's a really nasty reaction. So that's the worst case scenario. Often the dog dies. I don't know, did yours yeah. survive? Yeah, died. Um, yours survived, you're lucky. Um, well, it was only because it was actually the vet that was doing mm -hmm. this dental, and she had, you know, had all the safety procedures in place, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. noticed it right away. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's that's the important thing. Um, most of the time, I think, in from what from my my uh, all, all the information that I've been gathering is, um, it's not the true malignant hypothermia and. Um, it's more of a stress-induced hypothermia that's associated with anesthesia because what I'm, I'm finding based upon histories and so on, it's not a specific drug, it's really a lot to do with the circumstance and also in, in my impression is the type of dog, if the dog is easily stressed, is easily freaked out, um, that they're much more likely to demonstrate these symptoms. So it's, I think there's a spectrum that goes from the stress induced all the way up to malignant hypothermia. And frankly, if it had true, the dog had true malignant hypothermia, it's actually very likely the dog will probably die. Um, I've had one case recently from up in Spokane, and, and they did everything, and the dog still died. The critical thing for that is this treatment with uh, a drug called dantrolene, and vets won't, won't have it. Um, they do have it in big human hospitals um, because of uh, people people can get it. But vets won't, won't have that at all, and that's really for that. That the worst case, the malignant hypothermia, that's the problem. So we have been collecting some cases from deerhound. This is one that came up early on as nine-year-old male 
uh, Scottish Deerhound with a history of, of developing hypothermia after anesthesia. Um, and so uh, at that time, uh, this is about three or four years ago, the Deerhound Club actually uh, provided me some funding to, to um, do some gene sequencing, some very um, uh, focused gene sequencing. So we, we have this gene sequencing panel where we sequence 90 different genes for, uh, associated with different problems but this is just a it, it, instead of doing whole genome sequencing, which is about two thousand bucks a sample, we can do focused gene sequencing on what the genes of interest for you, and these are genes of interest for anesthesia and drug drug action, and so that's about two hundred two hundred dollars a sample. So it's much more cost effective. And what we did find is that with that one dog, if we look at a gene that we know is related to uh, malignant hypothermia, which is this RYR1 gene, we found this uh, novel mutation in there, uh, this 960 mutation. Um, and so at the moment, we're thinking that this myeloform form might be associated with this, this mutation. And basically, it, it it makes the muscles more twitchy, more reactive, and you know the possibility is it's being selected for for you know racing performance. Um, and you know, typically, people that have these mutations are much more hyper muscled. It's interesting. So we did. Uh, we are able to look at different breeds. Interestingly, it's not really a sight hound specific. It is very frequent uh, again in, in AKCs. Uh, it's also. Um, frequent in Scottish Deerhounds, although it's not that frequent, it's about 7% allele frequency, which means maybe about uh, one in a hundred are gonna be, uh, gonna have you know two copies of this gene. The other interesting thing is that it's actually quite frequently in, found in Great Danes, German Shepherds, Springer Spaniels, and these are breeds that, where they do have this history of stress hypothermia, so I um, um, need to look into this obviously more. Uh, do you have, uh, so we have greyhounds, we have Scottish deerhound, and these breeds. So the next steps with this, um, basically what I'm hoping to do is, again, continue to collect additional um, DNA specimens and history information from dogs that have had this problem. So far I've gotten uh, information and, and DNA from eight deerhounds, um, and about half of those have the gene, half of them don't, so there might be another gene involved, um, and, and from one greyhound case as well. Um, other breeds might be involved. Um, from that information, we can work out what are the precipitating factors. Um, there's a good indication that there's some kind of stress involvement. Uh, are there any specific drugs that might be causing this? Um, and really, it comes down to if we do test this in, in dogs, what would be our recommendation if they have the gene? Because that's always very important. Um, should there be specific drugs that should be avoided? And that's why that information that we're collecting is very important. Um, and actually, it, it's interesting because um, you know, I've had many conversations with Dr. Guillermo Kuto, who is a well-respected greyhound um, practitioner, and his uh, recommendation for the, he recognizes these dogs, and what his recommendation largely is giving uh, heavy doses of sedatives before a stressful episode. Like they're going into the clinic to have a, um, a I don't know, a dental or a, or a castration or something like that, then he, he uses these, these heavy doses of, um, of sedative drugs like acepromazine, trazodone, gabapentin. Okay, so this is the, the main topic that I wanted to talk about, which is this post-operative bleeding. And again, tying back to um, Dr. Kuto, uh, who did these studies back in the, the late uh, 2000s. So this condition of uh, delayed post-operative bleeding in greyhounds was recognized uh, back then. It was, he did a number of studies showing that about 28% of greyhounds showed delayed bleeding about 48 to 72 hours after surgery, and they published this paper showing that the, the types of bleeding that you would expect from normal, a moderate bleeding, and down there is just frank blood oozing from, from the, the wound. It's, uh, according to him, it starts maybe, it's, it's heaviest at around 48 to 72 hours after major surgery. And the, the, his thought was, based upon a number of tests that he's done, is basically that the, clot, the blood clot forms fine, but after it's formed, uh, it actually starts to, to break down, because that's the normal process, a clot form, and then it starts to break down with the healing process. But in, in these dogs, it seems to just break down way too quickly. Um, 
The important thing was that he was able to prove that these drugs which inhibit that breakdown process, uh, aminocoproic acid or tranexamic acid, work very effectively, if, particularly if you give it um, before the dog has the surgery. And so you start the treatment on the day of the surgery and then for uh, up to five days afterwards. His data, um, um, there are a number of potential genes that it pointed to, but um, I felt that looking at the data, it really pointed to this uh, one gene, um, serpin F2, that uh, makes this protein called alpha-2 antiplasmin, and I'll show you a little bit what that, that actual protein does. So in normal blood clotting, there's um, a clot that's formed by uh, different clotting factors, including factor seven. You, you, I know that you guys are testing for this, and this is an important clotting factor that causes um, fibrinogen to be, I can't even say that, um, fibrinogen to be turned into fibrin, which is the blood clot. However, as I said, the blood clot doesn't hang around always. It actually uh, starts to, you know, 24 hours afterwards, it starts to break down. So this is an enzyme called plasmin that actually breaks down, it's like a pair of scissors that breaks down the fibrin and turns it into these fibrin degradation products. And what alpha-2 antiplasmin does is that it actually is present in the blood and it puts the brakes on plasma. It slows down that process. It's normally there, but the problem is if there isn't enough of that there, then you get can get premature clot breakdown. What I do want to show here is it, it the p potential genes that are involved in this process are many, and you can just uh, just go through these. But basically, there's a whole bunch of genes that do regulate that. We've done some. We've got a, some headway into ruling out that those other genes, like um, A2M, serpent B2, serpent E1, and there's a couple more down the bottom that inhibit this breakdown at this point here. CPP2, uh, factor 13. Um, we, we believe, based upon the data we have so far, that it's really the serpent F2 that's, that's the problem. So these were two of the initial cases that were brought to my attention that were able to get DNA. We got, we got um, case histories and information. So one of them, SDH1, was a six-year-old male Scottish deerhound who had a splenectomy for a mass removal and a severe drop in platelets after 24 hours after surgery. Um, there's a whole history of clinical treatment in there, but basically, um, they eventually decided to treat with aminocoproic acid and it responded very well. So the other case is SDH2, again a six-year-old male Scottish deerhound. He actually had a past history of um, delayed bleeding after castration that also responded to treatment after the fact with aminocoproic acid. And then uh, after that had occurred, he went back in and he had a, again a, a splenic mass removal and uh, at that time, they decided to give it as a preventative, and he had absolutely no problems with that surgery. The very interesting thing is that both those dogs, which came from different parts of the country, um, and it took us a while to work out, were actually, um, they were litimates to each other, which is suggested that there maybe is a, a, a genetic uh, linkage going on there. So using our custom gene panel, we were able to actually find that in those two deer hound, they both had mutations in the serpent F2 gene. Um, we had, at that point, when we were running these samples, we had four different dogs, um, SDH1, 2, 3, and 4, that we considered them to be um, affected dogs. Um, and they were all either mutant mutants or they were heterozygous, wild type, type mutant. We also had six dogs in there that had undergone surgery, didn't need any aminocoproic acid either before or after, so they were kind of our controls, and all of those were actually, they were clear of the gene. So that's very preliminary data to say that uh, this might be something that we need to look at in, in more depth. So what we did was we wanted to find a lot more cases, and the way that we did this is we used um, your, um, your health survey to find these cases, and the cases that we were looking for uh, dogs that had undergone surgery without having received Amicar beforehand, um, that they had developed bleeding, severe bruising after surgery. Um, they may have been treated with Amicar after the surgery, and if they respond, that's a, that's a good indication that's probably what we're looking at. Um, but the important thing is that the bleeding was delayed. It doesn't happen in the first one hour, two hours, even up to 12 hours. It's usually the next day at which this occurs. Um, 
So starting one to four days after surgery, and the other important thing is that we had a DNA sample. Either the dog was still alive, we could get a DNA sample from them, or that it had a stored DNA in the chick database, and that's why the chick database is very in important in terms of you guys donating samples to that. So uh, the controls were, again, dogs that had undergone surgery, hadn't received Amicar, no evidence for, for any problems after surgery, up to day four, and that also that we had a DNA sample. So the next show, uh, uh, oh, okay. And so in the end, what we're trying to do is we're gonna take those cases, take those controls, genotype them, look at that serpent F2 mutation, and see whether all of those say that were cases had the mutation, the controls did not. And we were also, because the question was how important is factor seven in terms of this uh, particular disease, we also genotyped them for factor seven mutation. So we, we utilize the, your uh, uh, Deerhound Health Survey. I realize that there's issues because it's, you know, not everyone uh, submits to that. So we, there is somewhat of a selection bias in terms of people that submit uh, samples to that. Um, so we were able to review uh, records from 260 dogs that had uh, surgery. That, uh, of those, 155 did not have surgery, but 105 dogs did. Um, of those 105 dogs that had surgery, we had two dogs that, that did have bleeding issues. Uh, one of them uh, died and the other one survived. Um, but both of those had problems that started within 12 hours of surgery. And we also identified seven dogs that had bleeding um, that was in the right kind of area in terms of when it started, one to two days after surgery. Um, of those dogs, actually, we're fortunate all of those had DNA, so that's what we're, we considered our delayed bleeding cases, seven dogs. So we kept going looking at the other dogs that didn't bleed because we're trying to find controls now. So we had 96 controls. Um, dogs that got Amicar for, for prevention uh, were 25, so there's, there's a, quite a bit of Amicar usage out there. Um, but there were 90, uh, 71 dogs that didn't receive it, went through surgery, didn't have a problem, and of those uh, 71 dogs, we were able to find uh, DNA on 55 of those dogs. So that, that now, we've got seven dogs, 55 dogs, so we can now go ahead and genotype them. So the, the, the two questions that we asked were, uh, one is, do all of those delayed bleeding cases have the mutation, serpent F2 mutation? And that tells us how sensitive, say, a test, a genotyping test would be. The other issue is, are all of the dogs that were wild type, didn't have the mutation, free from delayed bleeding? And that tells us about the specificity, how good it is to identify uh, those, those dogs that may, uh, are less likely to have a problem. So um, the, the data is on the left-hand side here for the Serpent F2. And what you can see there in red are the cases. And all of the cases have either mutant mutant, that is, they have the, you know, you know, both copies are mutant, or they have at least one copy that, that's moving. So the important thing is that all the cases were actually detected by this, this test. Um, if they were wild type, wild type, they were all controlled. So if you have that um, uh, mutation, it's almost uh, certain, at least based upon this small, it's a relatively small number, but we're, we're projecting out that uh, it should be uh, very useful for detecting, detecting dogs that uh, probably are unlikely to have this problem. So when we looked at factor seven mutation, actually it turns out that it was, it did not predict uh, whether you're gonna be a case or control at all. In fact, um, those that were cases were, there were no, no um, cases that were mutant, mutant. There were two that were heterozygote, and actually there were five that, that were uh, wild type. So it appears that this particular condition, which is delayed bleeding, uh, is, is not associated with this factor seven mutation. Um, however, that doesn't exclude, you know, we've got cases that uh, bled early. In fact, it makes sense in terms of the biology. Factor seven is important for forming the cot. So that would, that would be a problem during surgery itself. The surgeon would note that, okay, it's not, it's not clotting, it's not clotting. Uh, there's a problem, you know. So the, the question is, will Serpent F2 genotype identify all bleeding cases? And the response is actually no. There's still going to be bleeding cases that are that are going to occur out there. There's important issues related to, and really it, 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 it comes back to, to the procedure, uh, the surgery, the type of surgery, how bloody it is and so on. Has a ligature slipped? 
is that are there some bleeders that are missing? And that happens, you know, you can't kind of avoid that. Um, the other possibility is that there are, are other clotting disorders. Early, early clotting um, problems could be factor seven. There might be other, I don't know if you guys have looked at all the different deficiencies that are out there in, in Deerhound. We can talk about that, that later, but it, those could be the explanation. There were those two early bleeder cases that I mentioned. Um, the one that started bleeding within three hours after they did an exploratory and, and the, the vet cauterized the bleeders and the dog recovered fine. So it probably wasn't related to a, at least the, the, um, this, this, uh, either the factor seven or the um, uh, serpent F2 deficiency. And in fact, they were both wild type when we, when we uh, sequenced them. There was another case there. Again, it's probably a typical thing that, that you hear about died from internal bleeding within eight hours of a spay. That, again, it's just a, it's an unknown. We couldn't get DNA, DNA on it. And so that's why it would be very important if that dog had DNA banked away so we could, we could use that information. So um, one thing we've looked at is what other breeds have this mutation. Is it only sighthounds? Could it be some other breeds? Um, and again, it's the same kind of setup where we have 67 breeds for our, our bank. Uh, the red bar is actually the Scottish Deerhound. So in terms of sighthounds, it's actually right, the Scottish Deerhound right in the middle. Again, Greyhound, particularly AKC Greyhounds are really uh, way up there, 80% allele frequency. It's, it's, there's a lot of uh, Greyhounds that have it. The, the second most is actually, interestingly, is uh, Irish Wolfhound. So I would be suspicious that there could be a problem amongst the Irish Wolfhounds. I know that they've started to do a, a survey of post-operative bleeding in the club. Dan Fletcher, who's a, a vet from Cornell who works in this area, has been working with them on that. So there's a possibility that Irish Wolfhound also have, the, have this problem. Um, you can see on the right hand side though, there's uh, some breeds with a much lower but potentially significant incidence. And this is just weird because we um, frequently we use our uh, local um, uh, technician uh, vet owned dogs from the area to do these studies. And we'd be, we get the DNA, we sequence them. And we were looking for some F2 um, carriers and, and mutants, and this one came up as a, as a double uh, mutant. Um, and it's a, a male, a five-year-old male uh, golden retriever called Gibbs. And actually, after, I went, after we found this, I went to her and I said, have you had any bleeding issues in this dog? Has it had surgery? It hadn't had surgery. But um, he said, yeah, it's, it's weird because when I take the dog out for uh, a hike, and when I come back, like the next day, it, it's, its um, claws will be bleeding. Um, so it scratched up its claws, potentially clotted, and then it's bled afterwards. And so that's a picture uh, that she took. Um, so uh, that dog also, uh, recently it had a, a mass on its, uh, on its uh, nose and had to have that removed. Was it a melanoma or something? What was it? It was a melanoma that had to be removed from its nose. And they, they were concerned about this because the nose is very bloody. And so they gave it some minocoproic acid and the dog did fine throughout. It's, that's just anecdotal evidence, but uh, interesting. What, one thing is that we're really working on, we don't have any direct data from greyhounds. Um, and the other thing that we don't have is actually any functional data of serpent F2. Remember before we had functional data of cytochrome people 50 we want to have functional data to, to prove that this mutation is attached to some altered function in the dog itself. And as part of that cytochrome P450 study, we actually collected plasma from all of those uh, 20 healthy greyhounds. And we had developed a, an assay to measure that, that uh, protein, the anti-plasmin protein, in the blood of these dogs. And we compared the activity of this protein, the function of that anti-plasmin protein between dogs in different serpent F2 genotypes. And very interestingly, we found that those that were mutant mutant had uh, substantially reduced activity of this protein in, uh, from the blood. So that's good evidence to suggest that this mutation is actually changing the function of that protein. Uh, and this is, this is in greyhounds. So the next steps. Um, we actually have been working with the club and with John Dilberger to actually um, submit a uh, provisional patent on, on this. Um, the idea is 
um, that uh, John was a co-inventor and is going to assign the rights to the club so the club will get half whatever comes out of this. Um, I don't know where it's going to go. This is just pr provisional. There's costs associated with it and we don't know. But we felt that it's important to actually uh, just put it out there. Um, I think one issue I want to be, I really want to, um, and John agrees with this, we want to have sort of some control over how this, this test is actually followed up on. We don't want to have many, you know, there are these companies in Eastern Europe that provide this and, and they have really bad information about these, these tests. So we want to have some control over that. And it, I doubt it's going to recoup any cost because there's probably not that many tests that would be run with this. Um, but. Uh, we don't know how that, where that's going to end up going, but I felt that that was important that we followed up on that. So the important thing is, uh, do we have any solid recommendations of what to do if a dog has this gene? And I think we've, we've really narrowed it down to, to these solid recommendations. One is for surgery, if the dog has the gene and it, the dog's going to undergo a, a, a particularly likely bloody surgery, but really most surgeries is to give uh, Amicar or tranexamic acid uh, orally every eight hours for day, five days starting on the day of surgery. Okay. We've also had some discussions about uh, breeding and, and that's, that's kind of what we really want to have some control over because uh, we've, we've uh, done like a, a risk benefit analysis of this and there's actually significant risks if you you know, really heavily tried to breed this gene out because you'd be losing important genes within the population. And I don't, for a Scottish deer hound, you really can't afford to do that. So you're going to lose a lot of genetic diversity. Um, so that's that's actually a, a big risk if you were you were planning to do that. But I think really there's no benefit from from getting rid of the gene because there's actually an effective. Um, treatment, if you know it, um, you know, you as breeders, if you advise the, the, the people that buy your dogs to get it uh, tested, and that's what people are starting to do, is we, we, we have this test that actually is, it, it, it greatly reduces even normal bleeding during the surgery. There's some risk, we haven't quite um, gotten a handle on it yet, there's, there's a potential risk and that's why, why we, we want to have this test out there, but there's a potential risk that if the dog didn't have the gene and you were just treating every dog with amino acid, is is you can have the opposite effect. You can actually have blood clots being formed, thromboembolism being formed from, the, from uh, overuse of this drug. And so that's, that's why we think that having this test is, is actually an important step forward. Th this test uh, should be available in the fall through Washington State University. Um, so this is where we ended up. We've, we've, we've got all of these problems that we've been working on. I think um, it, we've identified the genes. We've, we've, we've gone certain steps with the anesthesia sensitivity. We're very close to having confirmation of that. We're a little bit further behind on this hypothermia gene, but I think we've really gone as, uh, really as far as we can with the serpent F2 gene. I think that's um, something that uh, I think is going to be very helpful. So this is just some acknowledgments of my funding sources. Um, AKC is funded part of this, Scottish Deer Run Club. Uh, that's um, Stephanie Martinez, and again, two of our subjects, Otis and Seamus, uh, two greyhounds that, that she adopted. Um, and she's, uh, she's gone to Kansas State University, doing very well there. And so this is a, a region just east of here, up the Snake River. If you go up there, there's a place called Wawa White Canyon. And about a couple of weeks ago, it would have been like this with the beautiful sunflowers. These are my two dogs, okay? Um, the dog on the left is Minnie. She's, a mutt. Um, she's actually in my hotel room at the moment, <laughs> waiting for me to come back, I'm sure. And the dog on the right is the Maddie, our golden retriever, and she's, she's been our, uh, our very faithful subjects in many of our studies. She, she likes doing it. She likes the attention. So that's it. Thank you.